Fireside Chat, Episode 11. Welcome to the Rebuild. Recorded April 4th, 2013. Are you ready? See you around. It's time for another episode of Fireside Chat. Featuring Dan, Matt, and Lucas. We're back. I'm Dan, alongside Matt and Lucas, and gentlemen, welcome to, I don't know what era this is, it's not the Young Guns, it's not the 80s, but whatever era it is, I'll say what Feaster doesn't want to. It's a rebuild. Yep. Welcome to Ground Zero. I think we've got past this, I don't even know what you'd call it, this era of veterans, this era of trying to shotgun our way into a playoff spot, and finally somebody realized that something's got to be done. Well, at least the Flames now are starting on a fresh page instead of trying to shoehorn their way into, you know, being better. And hopefully the team does it right and drafts players that are good and all that fun. Yeah, it's, you know, long time coming. We've been waiting for it for, I'd say, two years now, at least 18 months. Lucas, you mentioned last week if uh, Feaster was the right guy for the job, you're wondering that. And I think that the fact he's – and who knows if no one else was allowed to or no one else held the, had the balls to, I don't know. But considering he's the guy who finally pulled the trigger on the big Jerome trade people have been calling for for a while, I think you have to keep him around uh, to let him see through his plan. I don't know about that. Honestly, I've uh... – I've seen a couple of schools of thought that uh, indicate, you know, you get someone like a Jay Feaster to make that big Jerome McGinley trade, and then you fire him in the off season so that whoever comes in has a chance, like a true clean slate, to basically mold the team in whatever way they want to do it. Um, and that, that, I wouldn't be disappointed to see that, to be honest. I mean, the fact that we got two fringe NCAA prospects and what's probably going to be a 26th to 30th overall pick. Like, Well, the thing is, is that uh, the return for Jerome actually wasn't too far off of what the Atlanta Thrashers got for Marion Hosa. Because in that deal, Colby Armstrong and Pascal Dupuis were also included, but you saw a late first-round pick and Angelo Esposito sent the other way like it's not really much different than that except that we'd everyone that was included in the marion hosa trade we'd heard of i don't think that's necessarily always a good thing though yeah because just because esposito is a name prospect well he's in switzerland now or something like that and completely irrelevant at least with hanowski and agostino they might be third fourth line guys that you can have on your team for a while i know but I, I just don't think it should have been a situation where it was one or the other sort of up here in calgary we also don't get a lot of ncaa coverage either so i think even if they were big names in their respective cities where they play they're not guys we would have heard of either way well i, I don't know how NCAA. much ncaa in general doesn't get much hype Exactly. So I don't know how much hype a guy who's playing on the 15th ranked hockey team in the country is going to reasonably get. Although I did read something that said he projects or he models his game after Ryan Callahan. And if we got a Ryan Callahan player out of this deal, I'd be fine with that. And the first rounder is nice. Well, the thing is with a poor man's Ryan Callahan, I mean, he's still going to fill up the bottom six slots and not every player you bring in can be a top six guy. There's only six of those. Uh, the thing is with NCAA prospects is that ones that have decent scoring uh, stats where they're roughly at a point per game, those players tend to become NHLers, even if it's only a third, fourth line guy. So, you know, you're, both those guys kind of fit in that grouping. So if Agostino and Hanowski both end up being, you know, marginal third fourth line guys basically replacing guys like como and jackman or you know like something like that like that at least you're getting some young players in there yeah i guess it's 
with both the Aginla trade and the Bolmeister trade, I I went through you know the five stages of grief with uh, with both of them, and there was a lot of rage. And I, I think I don't know if I if I uh, oh yeah denial rage uh, bargaining. Uh, there, I'm missing one in there somewhere, but I eventually got to acceptance in short order. But both returns, I, I just I did shake my head and swear a lot. So the Bowmeister trade was Jay Bowmeister to the St. Louis Blues for goaltender Red O'Bara and defenseman Mark Kandari. And then there's a first round pick and play and potentially a fourth round. It's all conditional. Um, I hope we get the first round this year. I thought arguably we may have got a better return for Jay than we did for Jerome. Without a doubt. I like Kandari. I've seen him play. I think he's a good defenseman. Again, maybe not a top two guy on your team, but I think he'll be a depth defenseman on this team for for a lot of years. And real realistically, the, this year's draft, like the Flames tried to get Ryan O'Reilly, and in the roughly 15 mark in the draft, which if the Blues make the playoffs, they'll be in that general area. There's a prospect that profiles to be somewhat similar to O'Reilly and Frederick Gauthier, and he's six foot five. So, you know, the, you might be able to get what we were looking for, but in another way. Yeah, and you I know, mean, I like uh, the I I just like having lots of first round picks. I mean, you know, I've always said draft early and draft often. The more picks you get, the better you're going to do, and it also gives you some leeway if the flames do have you know a 15th overall pick and they want to move it and you know trade down and get a third for their troubles or something i'd be okay with that too as long as they're staying in that first 30 picks i i do think it's interesting that uh you know we the the condition of the first round pick with from the blues is if the blues make the playoffs this year we get there first if they make and if they don't if we we get their first round pick if uh, the Blues make it in, uh, and if they don't, we get it in 2014. It does seem odd that you know, giving them Jay Bowmeister you're supposed to push them over the top. And uh, admittedly, he's not going to be a secondary player there, or he is going to be a secondary player there. But you know, well, they the were, the well, Jay Bowmeister or- playoff uh, uh, curse jokes write themselves. Yeah. Well, they were kind of on the fringe. Like, I think they were an eighth when they acquired them. And with the Oilers trouncing the Flames yesterday, they leapfrogged them. But, you know, either way, it's all right. Like, getting the first either this year or next. It's just hopefully we do something good with that pick. Either you know, way. I thought that the Jay Bomeister playoff curse thing is funny because if you look at the way the deal's structured, if the Blues don't make the playoffs this year, they owe us an extra pick. It's almost like they're being penalized for the Jay for the Jay Bomeister uh, curse. Mm-hmm. And and the other thing uh, that might come back to bite the Blues, I was reading today an, an idea about uh, possibly trying to trade either the Pittsburgh pick or something else to St. Louis for the rights to Patrick Berglund, who as an RFA center is going to demand a fair bit of coin, but since they're going to be paying $6.8 million to Jay Bomeister, and they're a fairly cash-poor team to begin with, and they're going to have, I don't know if Petrangelo's up this year, uh, Shattenkirk is going to be due for a raise, they might have to let him walk. Uh, the Blues could be uh, pilfered a bit in the off season. Yeah, well, it's going to be weird, I think, this offseason. I hope the Flames take advantage of it, but the fact that teams don't now don't have to trade for the right to talk to UFAs before their contracts expire, I hope that the Flames will take advantage of that and talk to some young UFAs and see if they'd be interested in coming here. I would stay away from too many UFAs. The, the one I'd really look at is uh, Bozak, and I, I think just to solidify some center depth, maybe... Nathan Horton, if you can get him for a reasonable price, or David Clarkson. But I, I don't think they should be uh, giving too many contracts out to middle-of-the-road players, Florida Panthers style. Although that, that's sort of what they're in a position to do, because if Kiprasov retires, 
they're going to have $34 million in cap space, basically. And, you know, you could go on a huge spending spree and probably still have to sign a couple extra bit players just to get to the salary floor. Yeah, I don't think they necessarily need to go out and sign a whole wacky UFAs, but I'd like them to talk to them. I mean, the more guys you talk to, the better chance you have of landing one. So if they go and talk to, you know, a dozen guys and end up signing two, I'd rather have that than try to jump in on a big sweepstakes like they have the last couple of years. Yeah, and I'm well, I'm sure they're, you know, everyone's going to talk to everyone now that that's even an option, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Speaking of sweepstakes in the last couple of years, why don't we talk about the claim from management that came down today? I heard it came down from Murray Edwards saying uh, they want the Flames to be a playoff team next year. Realistically, the Flames, they can't come out and say that we're going to be a terrible team because then you're going to dissuade people from buying tickets and buying merchandise and all that. They're kind of in a rock and a hard place because they don't want to see the Dome being filled with 10,000 fans instead of sellouts. I was just going to say, I think that they have to be careful with what they say. They've been saying they're a playoff team every year now for the last, you know, as long as I can remember since 04. It's, we're going to make the playoffs, we're going to make the playoffs. And every year they don't, and they let the fans down. And now they've made the moves that they've made. They've made moves to go ahead and move their key assets, the guys we all knew they'd need in the playoffs. So I think to say we're going to be a playoff team again next year is – not intellectually honest. Let's use Jay Feaster's terms here because he's the man that said, that said these. But I also think it's it's almost lying to your fans. Your fans know you're not a playoff team, and they don't want you to be a playoff team at this point. They want you to rebuild and do it right. So it's like, who are you trying to kid by doing this? I think it's a really poor PR move. Just say nothing or say, you know what, we're going to do our best to be competitive. Exactly. I mean, no one was pressuring them to say any of these things. Um and they nobody's just come expecting out and, a playoff team. No, no, nobody's expecting a playoff team, and no, certainly no one's looking for a proclamation from management. Because I, I, I want to know really who's, who they think is asking for these sort of sound bites, because all it serves to do is further make it look like you don't know what's going on, or or you're not acknowledging reality. Like just just tell us that. Next year, our goal is to be better than we were the last game, and we're gonna yeah, or carry our, that. Our we're gonna carry that through for eighty-two forward. games. Yeah, we're gonna carry that through for eighty-two games, and if we make the playoffs at the end of it, that's great. But as long as we are improving every game, that is what this organization is going to be uh, happy about, and we're not gonna when we're gonna stay the course with this rebuild and commit to a new core or finding a yeah. new core. Yeah, I just think it was foolish to come out and say we want to be a playoff team. Like, who are they kidding? Everybody knows they're not. You don't trade those pieces and then go, you know what? We're going to go out. And that almost makes you think that they're maybe planning to go and overbid in a Brad Richards like sweepstakes this summer to get those pieces back or similar pieces. Like, this is just foolish. You know, everyone knows you're not. Just admit it. I don't know why they don't want to say the word rebuild. Use retool. Use whatever you want. That's what this team is doing. I know. Like, the one thing I'm actually somewhat worried about is during the draft like you got a good opportunity with three first rounders to really kick start your rebuild and i'm worried that they might end up trading one or both of the later picks for marginal ish guys that are slightly ahead in their development curve and i don't yeah. think that's a you know like a, they really just need to commit to sucking for a while get the good players and, you know, hopefully turn it around properly instead of making half measures and, you know, just spinning your wheels and not doing anything. Well, I mean, let, let's examine that for a minute because, like, what what exactly constitutes doing it properly? Because in a world where you don't have a core yet, now the draft remains to be seen, and maybe you, you know, I, I assume you count... Sven Berchi is a core player. Uh, you hope Gaudreau and Jankowski would be core players. Uh, the, the problem is there's just nobody to build around right now. And maybe, you know, if you get McKinnon, Goche, and somebody else, they become part of your new nucleus. But I, like, I think the, the rebuild has to, or, or to successfully rebuild, you need to insulate those young players a little bit. Give them opportunities to succeed in ice time, but don't 
do uh don't go full Edmonton and be like, hey, welcome to the club. You're on the first line. You're getting all the tough minutes, and you're gonna save this franchise, and we're gonna be the next, you know, '80s dynasty Oilers all over again. It's gonna be great. Come on, guys. Saddle well, up. I, actually, I just uh, wrote an article on the Fireside Chat website, and in that, I was discussing that the teams that were successfully rebuilt, the Penguins, the Hawks, the Bruins, and the Kings, what they ended up doing prior to actually the wheels falling off like they have in Calgary, is that they had some of their defensemen and some of their character players already in place, as well as possible goalies for their future teams already in the system. And then they added more character guys and talent to that base of support. And, like, if you look at uh, TJ Brody, he's already uh, emerged as the number one defenseman on the team and probably the only NHL-caliber defenseman on the team, but that's another conversation. And you, ha- oh, and, sorry. and you have guys like Hanowski, Agostino, Alou, Reinhardt, Boma, those kind of guys that can be your pain-in-the-ass third fourth line guys that are just you know that you hate playing against because they're you know annoying <laughs> and if you can then add guys like Berchi, Gaudreau, Jankowski, McKinnon or whomever onto that then you can start building the nucleus of an actual cup contending team I have no problem with the Flames trading one of those three picks, and I think that's part of the reason you acquire three, so you have that ability. But it's got to be done for the right guy. And I would, depending on who we're bringing in, I'd rather trade one of those first, one of those three picks in the first thirty, um, to bring in a established young guy. If we could bring bring one in, and the names that are popping in my head are guys like, and it would take a, more than just a pick to get him, but someone like a Louis Erickson. A guy who we could bring in, he could be that centerpiece of the team, so we can afford to, as Lucas was saying, move some of those draft picks off to a second or third line. But he's still a guy we could build around for a number of years. Well, I'd I'd be really happy to see Louis Erickson here. I think the reason I would be more averse than anything to trading any of the first rounders, especially in what's considered a deep draft, is that you need your young players on entry-level contracts to be key producers that's in in a sense and i know that sort of counteracts what i just said but what what i mean just basically is that you need to get some value out of the years when they're not making any money and if you trade a couple of those picks off and for, for a guy who might help you a little bit more now uh, but you're still going to have to pay him that money, then all your salary flexibility kind of goes out the window. And when you need to re-sign your young guys, the, the player that wasn't necessarily a part of that core is now a bit of an albatross of a contract. And, and the biggest uh, thing that I think the team really needs to avoid is the bad contract. Well, I, that's why like, I would almost be preferring the Flames to, say, offer guys like Philpula, Bozak, and Clarkson, a little bit more money than they likely would get elsewhere, but like on like a three-year term, just so they can be the offensive catalyst so your team's not complete garbage, you know, mm-hmm. which that's what it's looking like it'll be next year. And... You know, you don't have to waste the first-round pick on a guy that's only slightly younger in Erickson. And, you know, you get the same basic effect without, you know, and you can let the kids develop properly. Mm-hmm. The problem the problem I've had with the way the Oilers have done it is, I, I don't know what you'd call it, but I call it the blind leading the blind. You've got a bunch of guys who have no NHL experience who are the top producers and the top guys playing the most minutes. And there's nobody there with that experience. I mean, they got Horkoff and they got um, now Jared Smithson, I guess, and Ryan Smith. And those are the only guys with real NHL experience. Everyone else's young guys are being thrown in there and they don't know how to play this game. They don't know how to 
I mean, they know how to play the game of uh, hockey, obviously, but they don't know what it means to be an NHL, and there's nobody there to help lead them and get the team out of those hard spots and that sort of thing. Well, it yeah. looks like it's so turning I around. I don't for want them. a bunch of guys that are 28 and younger. No, and you wouldn't necessarily have to do that. Like, especially, like, say you get, like, a guy like Clarkson or Philpula, you still have spaces in the lower lines so that, like, you don't have to rely on, say, like, Berchi coming in and just being slotted as the first-line winger and, okay, kid, go at it, you know, like... yeah. The Oilers seem to have a problem with attracting free agents, so like they can't really supplement the leadership like a normal team would. So you know that like that's the other, why their problem. The other thing I think the Flames have going for them is some of their assets that have still yet to move. I mean, at the draft, if they want to make a move, they could trade Camilleri, they could try to trade Tange. Um, there's still assets that this team can move if they want to make another deal. I think Tange, if he doesn't really uh check back in for the rest of this season is in danger of being a compliance buyout uh he has been beyond underwhelming since uh Iginla was traded which you know maybe he's just you know suffering from a little bit of separation anxiety but he he seems after uh after watching him leave the first time and seeing what happened to his career and now Jerome's gone. Uh, he seems to be a completely a product of his winger to to a large extent. Every, he can only changed man- so much, you know. I mean, when he left and he had all those problems in Tampa, you can't expect him to come here and be a new man all of a sudden. Exactly. So I think you know it, it's possible he's he's a compliance buyout. Uh, I just wanted to backtrack to a quick thing Matt said about uh, Brody being our number one. Uh, T.J. Brody's got a remarkable ability to play big minutes in blowouts and finish up somehow with only a minus one. Like I I always go back to the game in Boston where he played 26 minutes in a nine, nothing loss and was even. Yeah. And, and and last night he, against the Oilers, you know, I don't know if he played 26 minutes, but I'm sure he was well up over 22, 23. And I believe he was minus one. Like that may not quickly make a change when you see a breakout happening. Yeah, that, that that may that may not tell the whole story, but it says something. And I don't know if Brody's a true number one, but he he is the best defenseman on this team, and uh, at least defensively right now. And you guys think he'll close. chew up Olmeister's minutes for the rest of the year? Yeah. Why not? Like you might just... as well let the kid play and yeah. let him take it. Like it's like when the Blackhawks were really terrible, like in '06 and that. Like, they were running Seabrook and Keith out there for, like, 26 minutes a night, even though they, at the time, were terrible, just because they needed to learn how to actually be an NHL defenseman, and it helped them turn the corner and really blossom. Yeah, and uh, I think this uh, is going to be a little bit of a different result than, say, running Chris Butler out there with top pairing minutes every night, because in as much as Brody may at times look overmatched during this uh, period of his development, it will, I think, be self or pretty evident that he is growing with every shift, whereas Butler is just a guy who's playing over his head practically at every turn. Yeah. Well, but I mean, Butler was never slated to be that top four guy. Butler was, you know, a piece that we took back in the Regeer deal. Everybody knew was not going to be a big piece. And maybe he's your number six guy next year. Maybe he's your number seven guy. He's not going to be top four. I don't think he ever will be. Except we played him as a top two for 82 games. We've also played wingers at the center position. This year's been a, a crapshoot no, no, all the no, way but around. I mean, but you, you see what my point is that... Brody is worth that time and effort to keep on the top pair. Butler isn't. And you're right that he probably... We all, I think, arguably knew that he was what he was. And for whatever reason, the coaching staff didn't. But... Well, the thing is, is that, like, Butler at the time was only in his third season in the NHL. And you have to let them sink or swim and you know you give the guy the opportunity if he takes advantage of it good you got a top two pairing defenseman and he just didn't take advantage of it so 
Yeah, and Brody seems like he is taking advantage of it. Who who would you say Brody's uh, uh, proper like comparable in a couple of years is going to be? I've uh, compared him several times to Dan Boyle, just because he seems to play a somewhat similar style. I I used to think uh, I saw a lot of Brian Campbell in him, but he doesn't. It doesn't look like he's got quite the offensive instincts. No. But uh, just no, he's nowhere near as offensive as Campbell. No, his puck control yeah. is not as good, but it, it could develop in the AHL. And granted, that's the AHL. He was a lot more creative, and maybe that just comes with comfort and time. But I, I still hold out hope that I think his ceiling is probably a. I think he 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 hits fifty points once in his career at least. He might. Yeah, yeah, I'd go with that. So uh, the Flames traded. I think the biggest pieces that we all knew would go. We got rid of Iggy. We got rid of Kipper. Um, I was surprised personally that Stemniak didn't go. But there's one piece they've still got after the trade deadline, and that's Mika Kiprasov. Um, and we won't get into all the details. I'm sure our listeners know what's going on there. But what's your guys' thoughts on Kipper and the whole fiasco that's gone on there? I'm pleased with the organization that they treated him with respect and allowed him to make the decision because realistically you might have got a second round pick for him and for what all the things that he's done for this organization I think that a second round pick who might maybe be an NHL or someday isn't worth disrespecting your player who's been so clearly one of the faces of the franchise. The best player in the, in the last nine years, I think, yeah. year to year. Well, we've all heard Jay say numerous times that if there, if it wasn't for Kipper, he wonders if it's possible to finish lower than 30th. So you know that Jay Feaster's got a huge amount of respect for him. I've got a huge amount of respect for him. I respect the fact that, you know, the Flames acquired him as a third-string goalie from San Jose, and they gave him the chance to open up, and he's done such a good job. And he really has been the, I'd say, more than Iggy, the number one on-ice guy for this team for so long. And it shows how classy the Flames are. As much as they get flack for so much, people have always said it's a classy organization and a good place to work, and I think... Like Matt said, they treat him with respect, and they showed this organization is good to their people. And I was glad to see that. If Kipper wants to stay, he wants to stay. I've heard people say they mismanaged the asset. They should have traded him a couple years ago when they could have. To me, I think let's let Kipper ride off into the sunset as a flame, and if we never see him again, we never see him again after this year. If he wants to retire and go to Finland and fish, I'm totally cool with that. It it is sort of unfortunate that – if he does ride off into the sunset uh, on this team, it's sort of like the end of Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade, except Sean Connery dies. Well, yes, yeah. you are riding off into the sunset, but you're decidedly dour about it. It's like, ugh. And, you know, I think the fact uh, the Flames acquired Red O'Bara is an indication that they might be expecting that. Now they've got O'Bara, they've got uh, Ramo. They're trying to shore up some depth there that they probably didn't feel like they had before. All John the... McDonald is not a replacement. No, not at all. And uh, given that, uh, I don't know, none of, none of our goalies should be back next year, even Taylor. Taylor, can if he wants to come back for a, a two-way, uh, one-year minimum contract, then he can try out with everyone else, but... Irving, goodbye. McDonald, goodbye. Brust. I'd keep Taylor and play him in the A. Honestly, with Laurent Brassois getting a contract today, I mean, I think you want to see what he does. Like, I'm. Yeah, you can always loan out a goalie, too, to another team, just so you've got yeah. them as insurance, though. Yeah. I, I, I don't know. It's just, uh, I, I see, especially in a at, at a time in the organization's life when we've got no answer for a number one, and everyone in the organization who has a set of pads should be fighting for that job. Uh, we can't afford to have an AHL guy taking up a roster spot in our farm team, just collecting wins because that that's not what the farm team is there for. 
No, I got to have Ordeo and Brassois duke it out in the AHL next year and, you know, each get 40 games type of thing and let's see who's got what. Truthfully, I think every goalie who comes to camp should have as legitimate a shot of sticking with the big club as everyone else because none of them have proven anything. So if if the guy if the best guy in camp is in fact Laurent Brassois, then you know what he he can always be sent down to the AHL, but he's going to start with the team, or he should. Or yeah. if it's Barra or Ramo or Taylor or who or Ordeo, just everyone needs to be given their shot to grab that number one job, and we've got to be very we they've got to be very decisive. Uh, with uh, who they're going to, or, or sorry, uh, they've got to be very decisive about not letting guys play for too long. It's going to be very apparent if a guy can or cannot play in the league. You know, I've thought about this this week, and I'm thinking of all times for Kipper's contract to be at a stage where he can walk away, and for him to be ready to walk away. I mean, I can't. I'm not in his head. I don't know what he's thinking, but from everything I've seen, it looks like he's come to grips with the fact he might walk away. And I'm thinking of all times. This is as good as any. I think this might be the best time for him to walk away. What do you guys think? Well, I mean, it it it's no worse than any other. No, no worse or better, I don't think. I think uh, he, he, you wouldn't want to go out this way simply because it was a 48-game season and the team had its worst finish ever. But on the other hand, if you really just don't want to put yourself through the hassle of playing through a rebuilding team or playing through – we're playing for a rebuilding team. We're playing for a team that's not the Flames. I mean, it kind of sucks that this is the way it ends, but it is nice that possibly one of the best players in franchise history is actually going to retire with the Flames because the last person to really do that and stick it out to the end was Lanny. Fleury yeah. doesn't count. Vernon doesn't count. They went off and did other things, and then they came back for a brief period, and you know, it, it was weird at best. If I was Mika, I probably wouldn't want to come back next year. I mean, what am I playing for? It's not like I'm playing for the cup anymore. I'd be just, you know, playing to keep the team's head above water. And I don't know if I'd want that. I don't know. If I'm Mika, I mean, Gannett, I'm far more, I'm sure I'm more selfish than he is. But I'd look at it and go like, look, I can still clearly play the game. If you give me more than a paper mache defense, I'll do all right. Uh, and give me an extension, and I'll play for another couple of years and bank another nine, ten million dollars. That, I can see Mika being like at. Dominic Hasek, though. He retires and then goes back to Europe and plays another five, six years in Finland. He, he might do that. I, I don't know. If you it, want to play, there's hockey to be played elsewhere. Yeah, but I mean, I don't think if he left the Flames, he'd be out of an NHL job. I think. No, but I think if he up. leaves the Flames, it means he's done with the NHL. Yeah, sort of like Roman Turk. Yeah. Yeah, just yeah, think I mean, if... if he walks away next year, he can't really come back with somebody else because he walked away from his NHL contract. So I think if he walks away next year, he's done with the NHL. I suppose, yeah, good point. You guys know how that rule works? If you retire and then you want to come back, do you still have to serve out the last year of that deal? I have no idea how that would work. Yeah. I think they. I think what would what would probably happen is a team would own your rights. But I, I can't, keep on, I'm completely making things up at this point. But it but would then, make yeah, sense. Yeah, then those rights count against the 80 total players you can have rights to. So I don't know but, if they'd want to carry those rights. Okay, well then they don't. If they don't carry them, they don't carry them. But if he's retired, you know, I assume he wouldn't retire and then unretire six months later. It would. If he was going to come back, it might be like a Yager thing where he comes back after a couple of years and at that point i don't know i i don't think anyone on the flames would be like oh no you're coming back here i think it would just be like yeah oh, okay we never see goalies make a successful comeback either we see some fords i don't can't think of any defensemen i can't remember a time we've seen a goalie come out of retirement and have any success Pass it. No. it's debatable he won a stanley cup didn't he or did he he was oh, playing maybe. for a really – yeah, I, I don't know how much success he had. I mean, he had a really good team in front of him, and I think you know, any half-decent backstop could have played those couple years when he came back. 
Well, he went to the conference finals one year. I think the year they won the Stanley Cup, Osgood was the guy, but I don't know if that was because of a Hasek injury. I'm um, not sure. But you know, whatever. No, not the point. But, you know, your, your point is valid, and I don't know why I'm bringing up the one exception to the rule. You know, goalies in general, you're right, don't come back. And if they do, they I mean, we've, Florida. we've heard guys talk about that. We've heard guys talk about coming back, and it just it never happens. No, it, and there's a reason it never happens. I'd rather Kipper just leaves next year if that's what he wants to do. He's no good if his heart's not in it. So if his heart's not there, leave, you know, retire a flame. I think the team could use that morale boost right now, and the fans could use that morale boost of having one of our two big stars retire a flame. And maybe we'll see him in 10 years at the next outdoor game alumni match. Yeah, yeah. and, um, you know, retire his jersey and all that fun, then. An actually retire it. Retire it, not honor it. Yeah. That, that's nonsense. Oh, I know. And plus, and plus, you know, like, who's going to wear 34? Really? Like, just retire it. Jerome should be retired, too, as soon as he retires. We got three numbers up there right now. Two retired and one honored. I talked to Ken King about this a little while ago. I went with a friend of mine to one of the season ticket holder lunches, and I had two complaints, one being that we're honoring numbers, not retiring numbers, which I felt was disrespectful to the player. I thought it was disrespectful to Al McInnes not to get his number retired. Second one was that they moved the banners onto the air vent, and they're not over the ice where they belong. I was told, expect numbers to be honored, not retired from here on in, as long as Ken King is in charge, pretty much. And secondly, that the banners are easier to see where they are now. So it doesn't sound like he cares. Yeah. Well, the thing is, is that it because you've honored these numbers, then unretire Lanny and well, that's it, uh, yeah. Vernon, you know, and honor them instead. You know, you, you can't. You like, can't have you it say, both ways. I think, I think McKennis and uh, Flurry were more important to the franchise than Vernon is. Yeah. My worry with honoring the player instead of retiring the jersey is that we might see guys up there who don't deserve it. We might start seeing guys like Joe Newendike and stuff who are impact players but don't necessarily deserve to have their number retired, but they're going to honor the player. And I'd be fine with that. You know, like, it's just one of those things that do it one way or do it the other yeah, not I agree. any half measures like it's like with the flames wanting to make the playoffs like just suck for a while no half measures <laughs> yeah you know what i mean a guy that will never be retired or honored on this team um and the lucas has got to be happy to see go is your favorite player number 17 Blake Como is now a blue jacket and you'll be wearing 14 I was really surprised the Flames were able to even make a deal and get something for Como. I didn't think anyone would pay for him, and I thought it'd be a throw-in on some other deal. <laughs> nice thing about it, too, is it's a net positive. That's not a trade you're ever going to have to wonder if the Flames won or lost. I mean, they acquired him for nothing off waivers, and they end up flipping him for a fifth in the end. So, in essence, they get a free fifth rounder. Everyone's got their hits and misses. He was a miss here, and they moved him, and, you know, things are good again. If we look back through history, number 17 really doesn't have an illustrious history on the Flames. Jason Botterill, Sergei Krivo Krasov, Chris Clark, Chris Simon, Eric Goddard, Rennie Bork, an illustrious list of number 17s. Any of those guys you think should be honored? All of them. Jamie Hislop, Yari Herdina, <laughs> Wes Waltz. Todd Halushko. I know it would be a good way to honor those guys. The Flames could name a bathroom stall after them in the men's room. You could sit down and read the history of the guy while you're using it. With the deadline just behind us, any hits or misses you guys think the Flames made? Anything you think they should have been in on that they weren't? Or anything you think they should have done that they didn't? Uh, realistically, they did what they needed to do. Like, they they still have the draft to trade players, and, the, you know, most of the guys that you're going to look at trading are still under contract for next year, so you can just trade them next year at the deadline. So, yeah, you still need bodies to play the game. 
you know, you can't just flush the whole <laughs> team out the door. Yeah, no, so. I agree. I think that they made just enough moves. I mean, it's not like we're bulking up for a playoff run. And as we always saw with Daryl Sutter, the draft is a fine time to trade, just as fine as any other time. So I think we'll see some movement at the draft table. Well, like, if you look at Camilleri, uh, he's making $6 million right now. And if you look at uh, when Lanko was traded to Phoenix for Stempniak, like, you're likely going to see a similar thing where a third or second line guy gets included in that trade that's, you know, so the team can save a little bit of money. Do you guys think Barchi comes back up for the rest of the year? I would actually leave him in the AHL and just let him dominate the AHL and, you know, start fresh next year, new team, and, you know, no headaches. Yeah, I can see both logics. I can see keeping him down there to dominate. I can also see bringing him up and letting him play some more at the NHL speed, just kind of get a better read on what they think they've got there. Hey guys, I'm just looking at some numbers here. So the Flames have never had more than one pick in the top round before. No matter how many teams there were through different expansions, ever since the team moved here in 1980, they've never had more than one pick in the top round. And they've never picked higher than sixth overall. So I think both things are going to happen for the first time this year. As such, I think we should congratulate Jay Feaster. He's breaking Flames records by setting these two big records and because he's broken two records in one season i think he needs to be honored next season a jay feaster banner up on the air vent next to the other ones is more than appropriate i think my final thought for the week is going to be the title of one of our shows a couple weeks ago but go flames go for the long term i'm optimistic but it's going to take some time for this team to get back to what it is now and get past what it is now well, we'll be back. We'll see how much there is to talk about. This uh, news is going to dry up quickly with the trade deadline being over, but we'll be back and we'll have more Flames talk. As always, be sure to check out firesidechat.ca for great articles. Uh, follow us on Twitter at Fireside Podcast or check us out on Facebook, and the link to the Facebook page is on the website. Um, connect with us, tell your friends about us, and keep listening. We appreciate the support. Suck it, Tom. Fireside Chat Podcast, produced and edited by Dan Stevenson.